Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking About Birds, the only Cardinal podcast that, like Rob Manfred, has stupid ideas on how to improve baseball. <laughs> My name is Nate Heininger, and I am joined, as always, by Vince Morka. Multi ball is good. Multi ball is good. That opening bit came to us via text message. If you have an idea for the opening bit, text or leave a voicemail at 848-48-BIRDS. And uh, hey, if you want to hear your name, you know, include it. I'll, I'll throw it in there. Uh, but thanks to whoever sent us that one. Yes, that is in reference to our multi-ball discussion from last week, uh, which I, you know, think Stand is a behind. great idea. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, thanks for contributing. Um, Hambone, how you doing? I will be seeing you in real life in about two days. Yeah, apparently uh, I'm picking your ass up from the airport, which yeah, I, you know, can't wait for that. And I'm not paying shit. Yeah, well, I'll steal yeah. from you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm excited, man. We got a, we, we're going skiing in Steamboat. I'm gonna yeah. shove you down a mountain. I was just mapping out our, our game plan and how uh, I'm going to get you up on skis. My lovely wife is going to try skiing. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I love skiing. Love snow, love friends, and uh, you know if you happen to be there, then um, it'll be fine. We'll all, yeah, it'll, it'll be yeah. fine. We'll bring down the party too much. I, I am interested to see. So uh, Ben's wife has been snowboarding for a very, very long time and is very, very good at it. Uh, but she's going to ski for the first time, and this will be my second time skiing. I'm just going to assume that she's already better at at skiing <laughs> than me. But we're yeah. going to um, we're going to be able to ski together a little bit, which will be fun, but also I'm, embarrassing. I am flirting with the idea of trying snowboarding. Uh, I was so wondering I, if you're going to. I yeah. might go roll with y'all, but uh, we'll, we'll see how uh, the snow is and see how everything goes. But we'll we'll see. Yeah, it, it's going to be a really good week, and I'm ecstatic. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. I have a couple of personal goals, uh, n- mostly centered around not getting uh, fucked up by the ski lift anymore. Uh, let's see. Last year, I or two years ago, I uh, stayed on it a little too too long, which resulted in me sort of falling off of it. And yeah. also, uh, I had problems at the start where I got crushed by it one time. That, uh, that's so. the only really scary. Oh, trees are scary, but you'll stay away from trees. Yeah. The amount of injuries I've seen from newbies getting picked up by the ski lift is scary. The ski lift this, doesn't it doesn't care. It doesn't oh, know, man. This is where we need AI. We need that ski lift paying attention. No, yeah, God forbid the, is not God forbid the humans to be. God forbid yeah. the humans are paying attention. No, yeah, make the machine do it for me. Well, that's what happened. Uh, me and two other people were kind of not where we're supposed to be, and the uh, we kind of got caught in between. Basically, yeah. you know, you're supposed to like shuffle up and get into the seat, and right. we we were in a bad spot, and the the operators were not paying attention, I guess, and didn't hit that uh, nice button there that would have stopped the whole <laughs> thing from happening. Uh, yeah. But, it, it was all fine. I mean, no, not hurt or anything. Because once yeah. we had been crushed by it, they saw it and stopped it. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, they, what probably happened is they looked at you and they were like, "This guy's a pro. We don't need to pay attention." Uh, well, that I have my my gear on. Oh, you know, yeah. My goggles looking good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I get a, a quick PSA. I know people come to this podcast for skiing advice. When uh-huh. you're in the lift line, as soon as the chair passes you, you follow that chair up to the line. Go, run, quick. Uh, the people that don't do that, it drives me nuts. Be quick to the chair. Yeah. Um, and, wow. and you won't get crushed. Yeah. Well, those chairs I'll try are to handy. remember that this time. Yeah. I, I would recommend that you do remember that. I'll shove yeah. you up there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I haven't been, I haven't done it in two years. And so it's my second time going. So uh, assuming I survive, we'll, we'll report back next week how it went um but uh you had an experience uh recently that i've been really interested in hearing about but because we have a normal friendship i've waited until the podcast to uh <laughs> to check in about this oh <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, you went to the the, the revived casa yes. bonita in uh, i did in denver so um so i gotta hear about it 
Okay, so just to give a little background information, because I know not everybody's like paying attention to local Denver news, but this is very exciting. If you're a South Park fan, you might remember the Casa Bonita episode. Casa Bonita is a real restaurant. It is about 10 minutes away from my house, um, and it has been defunct since the pandemic. Once that uh, uh, restaurant officially filed for bankruptcy, the two South Park guys, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, bought it um, (laughs) and basically sunk a bunch of money into it, fixed it up, dressed it all great, redid the food, redid the menu, redid the drinks, redid the sopapillas, everything. Mm. Um, And now it has been opened. We have been requesting a reservation for nine months. That has been open. We signed (laughs) up. Mary signed up. I signed up separately. Her reservation got selected nine months after we submitted. We roll up to this place and it's in a shopping, like a like an outdoor shopping mall type thing. And it is packed to the gills. There is security. We have to go through metal detectors. We have our reservation time. Um, and it, I mean, it was just bumping. My lovely wife decided uh, she she went for the little upgrade and got us cliffside dining. Um, cliffside dining. Okay. Cliffside dining. Wow. Uh, which means so normally the experience there is you go down, you sit down, you order your drinks you go through like there's kind of like a cafeteria line. You get your food, go sit down. And, and then after you eat and drink, you can kind of walk around. And it's it's like, I mean, there's games. There's a magic show. There's cliff divers. There's music. Uh, there's a couple of different gift shops. Uh, there's a cave. I mean, mm. this place is unbelievably Classic massive. Restaurant there. It's yeah. 52,000 square feet, and it can <laughs> sit 1,000 diners at any given time. Right? We went through the museum. There's also a museum about Casa Bonita. So anyways, <laughs> Mary Springs for the cliffside dining, and we're sitting there eating a, a fine meal. It, w- it was fine. The cocktail was delicious. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like mezcal and ginger beer and some other stuff. It was it was really nice. Sounds so great. Anyways, we're, we're right by the cliffside. And this music, like a gong starts ringing out. And then you hear Trey Parker's voice doing oh this like God. pseudo like uh, a long time ago. Uh, the uh, the diving was brought to America and, and inherited yeah. by Mexican culture. And he's going on this whole thing. And then this like kind of me shaped guy comes out, walks <laughs> oh. out onto the uh, uh, wearing like his skivvies, walks out onto a cliff and just shouts cannonball. And jumps into the water, probably a 20 foot drop and soaks everyone around <laughs> us. Uh, luckily, the water avoided us by magic or, or I don't know, Mary, maybe that was something to do with the seats that Mary bought. But uh, I mean, it was a magical experience. If you don't know what it is and have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, I implore you to Google it. Um, yeah. But now, we had a fine you, meal. Are you considering that as a potential career path? Being a, a no. So. At first, I was like, yes, I, I got the mass. I can do a big cannonball. I could splash everyone. But the guys come out every 20 minutes. And the next time he he was, they were doing these like really complex like uh, spins okay. and jumps so and climbing up. Now that element, you're like, I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. If, if you yeah. want to say like, who can make a massive cannonball? I'm your guy. I got a lot of mm-hmm. mass. I can move quickly sure. and make a big splash. But no, they, these guys were clearly like high school diving team guys. They, yeah. they they had some skill. They were also funny. Um, so I've just That's not qualified. Just lost all the qualifications. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so yeah, we ate, we explored. There was a mariachi, mariachi band. Uh, we went to a shooting gallery. Um, I won a hacky sack uh, wow. with a diamond on it. it. It was quite the evening. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. Um, yeah, I I. There's not much like that here in St. Louis. I don't know that there's a single thousand seat uh, dining experience. I guess maybe like eating at Ballpark Village just in the yeah. middle of the, <laughs> you know, that's maybe our, our closest comp, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I could go on and on. There was a there was a magic wishing well in the middle of the restaurant when you threw a coin into it. There was like a little face at the bottom that would tell you to uh, make your own luck and uh, just be happy you're alive. It was like. <laughs> Every aspect of it was completely bizarre and like kind of sarcastic in the yeah. South Parky humor. That's type what I was going to say. Is that the South Park influence or was it that way before? I guess we, we don't really know. I, I don't know because, yeah, I, I had never been there. And then the set because I'd always heard it's like the food is despicable. The place is disgusting. 
Um, and in, they're in the museum. They even talk about the South Park guys put in like X many millions of dollars just to get the pool in working order. Like the place was completely fucked up and then they fixed it really like seemingly as a bit. Yeah, I, I don't really get what. But like there's there's they, they don't need the money or anything like that. But uh, I don't know. Very, very funny and very exciting. And it was great. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, maybe I don't know. How, maybe in a couple of years, if once the heat dies down a little bit, uh, since I'm out there a little more sporadically, I don't know that I could rely on getting a uh, a reservation very easily. Yeah, but I would uh, not say fly out here for it. But if you're in the area that, and you can get there, it is so worth it. That's what I mean. Like maybe yeah. eventually the reservations won't take nine months and, and I'm out there and we could we could go uh, as sort of a in the moment thing rather than have yeah. to wait nine months. I think that would be lovely. I'd love to show you some local Denver culture. Yeah, well, yeah. And, you know, I've been learning Spanish, so, uh, you know, it might be. A... <laughs> yes, I do. Casa Vanita, pretty house. Very good, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about baseball. Uh, okay. the, Car- the Cardinals did a move. An the interesting Cardinals move. Did a move. A good move. A good move. I, yeah, I, I know. You and I haven't even really talked about this yet um, before the show. So uh, the Cardinals finally sort of made good on all the different rumors and whatnot of them exploring the uh, middle reliever market. Not quite the tier that we were expect or or had been reported you know what with your right. your josh haters and whatnot um but still i think a yeah a far cry from josh hater that's, yes to be yes. clear yes um so i think it's probably a tear down from what a lot of us were hoping but that all aside uh the cardinal signing keenan middleton is something that i'm pretty excited about i think we can dig into the numbers a little bit here but uh what are your what are your uh sort of initial thoughts ben yeah i think um it's They've done a good job at building a bullpen this offseason, and they've taken a lot of guys uh, uh, who are uh, taking flyers on a lot of guys. They've acquired some guys with specific skills, whether it be a power sinker or a uh, a, a, a nice um, a slurve or no, we don't call it a slurve anymore, a uh, a, uh, a sweeper. Um, and then they went out and got a guy who has been a major league reliever in the past and has actively improved himself over the past two mm-hmm. calendar years. Um, and he, I mean, the guy's got arm talent. Um, he, you know, his fastball sits in the high nineties. Um, and in the last basically season and a half, really towards the end of this, uh, of 2023 season, he kind of started changing how he rolls out his repertoire, yeah. uh, really leaning on his changeup, which is a pitch that is one of the better off speed offerings in baseball throwing his slider a little bit more and then kind of keeping his fastball as more of a secondary pitch. He's kind of, he's like a power junk ball thrower. Um, and really, however you split it, this guy's got a lot of talent and a lot of things that the Cardinals need swing and miss, um, with percentage. Um, he limits hard contact. He is a ground ball, uh, uh machine as well. He gets 56% ground balls last year while also striking out a ton of people. Um, I mean, it's all great. He's got a little bit of a walk problem, um, and that's been, you know, the case in his career. But as this guy matures, um, for the money, we didn't mention that he, uh, he's a one year deal with a club option for 2025, it's 5 million bucks next year. Um, and then either a $1 million buyout for 2025 or 6 million bucks to retain him. Um, I think for that money with his history, how he's been improving and just the underlying baseline numbers that we have. Yeah. There's no reason I, or, or we should be very excited about this. I, I think it, he could be a contributor in the seventh or eighth tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and y- you basically spelled out it exactly. Take a look just at his second half numbers from last year when he really started adopting that, uh, that new, um, sort of pitch mix or repertoire, as you put it, uh, really leaning on that change up, just totally changed his results. Yeah. And while it is a small sample size, because, you know, he's a reliever, it's an inherent s- small sample size. Uh, it is the continuation of a, of a trend towards higher, um, higher success. So I'm pretty excited about it. And, you know, we, 
we try not to uh, get too much on the money stuff because it's not our money and that is like kind of frustrating, but um, you can't argue with the value here. It, it certainly seems like this is going to be one that uh, pays off very, very quickly. As you said, I, I think, you know, we're going to see him and Kittredge uh, sort of establishing themselves pretty quickly as that seven, eight guy which is great because that means all of these flyers that we're actually pretty high on, but are still flyers. Um, they don't need to be that seventh, eighth guy. Right. Maybe, you know, um, and the bullpen going into 2024 is essentially an entirely new bullpen. I mean, it really is. Yeah. I think there's something like 10 pitchers on the major league roster this year that were not there last year. Yeah. And um, so that's, you know, three starters. And then like seven relievers. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can argue about the quality of the decisions and the overall makeup of the uh, the new pitching staff. Um, but at this point, you really can't say that Mo and co sat on their hands this offseason. It is a fundamentally different pitching staff going into yeah. 2024. And I think we all maintain our uh, concerns around the rotation that we've been complaining about for years now, but uh, the bullpen, I said it last week, even before the Middleton signing that I think the bullpen has a chance to be really elite. And this Middleton signing seems like kind of a coup. Like it's kind of surprising that yeah. he was only 5 million. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Great you, signing. You look at the bullpen and you, there are five guys in there that you feel really confident in. Uh, Helsley, obviously one of the best relievers in baseball when he is healthy, uh, Gio, uh, Gallegos, who's been great for the Cardinals, Jojo Romero, who broke out last year, Andrew Kittredge, who we, I have a lot of faith in him bringing that, that repertoire and, and that power sinker and, and being successful. And then Kenyon Middleton, Keenan Middleton, um, kind of rounding it out, but having five options that you feel pretty good about throwing at any point and guys that get strikeouts, guys that get ground balls. Um, and then you're, you know, we've talked about Palante. We've talked about Ryan Fernandez. Uh, right. Where is, uh, 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 where is uh, um, uh, Libertor going to fit into this situation? How is Zach, Zach Thompson, Thompson. going to work yeah. in? Is Adam Klothenstein, is he a reliever in the short Brian. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of options and you have the, I'm not saying that Keenan Middleton is an established name, but he is a, a bit of a known quantity. He has major league innings and based on the things that we've seen in the recent future, you have a lot of reasons to think that he is on the upswing. Um, the recent and not, future. The recent future? The recent past. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting too excited about the bullpen. Uh, I just feel like I, you just like blew my mind with this, the phrase recent future. <laughs> <laughs> is that like now? Is like, is that like now? Uh, now. It's is right it, now. And like, yeah, it's like, right there yeah um so yeah anyways i'm excited nate this is good I'm excited too he had an 11.37 uh k per nine last year which blew out his previous years so when we talk about pitch mix like he is a fundamentally different pitcher coming into this year than he was uh on on previous years uh in 2022 with arizona he had a K per nine of 7.94 year before that 6.97. And then last year, suddenly 11.37 uh, with a 3.26 X FIP, which is really, really good for a reliever. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, we'll see. There's obviously there are other, there's countering points to all of that, which is why you are able to get him for one year at, at 5 million with a club option. Um, which is a really team friendly deal. So, you know, nobody in the bullpen is ever a lock, but you, you got to feel pretty good about him coming in. And, yeah. um, and as Ben just laid out too, he doesn't even have to be the best. You know, he's, he's along with four or five other guys that we think are all uh, competing for, for those high leverage spots. Yeah. Uh, in a corresponding move uh, after the Cardinals sign Keenan, uh, they announced that they DFA'd uh, right-hander Guillermo Zuniga, which is disappointing. Uh, predictably, uh, he was just picked up, traded for. Uh, he is now an angel. 
Um, that was announced right before we started recording, uh, which makes sense. The Angels are doing everything they can to not be terrible. Uh, and Anaheim has sent cash considerations to the St. Louis Cardinals for Guillermo Zuniga. So disappointing. Um, yeah. But obviously, if you're you know on the Cardinals, you I, I would much. I would uh, rather put money on Keenan doing well than Guillermo doing well. Um, for all the reasons we just stated and Guillermo just hasn't been healthy. He hasn't been there. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly feels like there's someone else that could have been cut. You know, there's like yeah. five first basemen on the roster and whatnot, but, uh, <sighs> there is, you know, teams are looking for a balance and at some point you can get to where you are carrying too many relievers. There's only so many opportunities and so many innings and, you know, you've got, uh, we have a lot of options now. But right. it's still disappointing. I think you know we both have been super high on Zuniga um, since well, he became a Cardinal. And, and when you see the flashes, yeah, yeah, the stuff that he has, it's, I mean, yeah, little idiots like us get excited about that. It's, yeah, it's, so, it's, it's elite stuff. The Angels don't have a great bullpen, so I suspect uh, if he's going to be successful, it will be with them this year. Um, he should get plenty of opportunity to pitch. He could close so, games out. I want like, yeah, no, I he, guess, I, mean, I guess Estevez is pretty good. And Estevez they said Robert is pretty Stevenson, good. who's pretty good. Yeah. But after yeah. that, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he uh, caught some saves. Um, yeah, uh, I wouldn't either. Role. Yeah. Um, so, but I guess we need, you know, a backup, backup first baseman. So speaking yeah, of, I, I, uh, yeah. our backup, backup first baseman, Alfonso Rivas. Um, yeah. we talked about this move probably too long last week. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you remember, Moises Gomez was DFA'd to acquire Alfonso Rivas, uh, our ninth, eighth, ninth first baseman, because um, I'm putting Chandler Redman over him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, that guy hits dongs, and I uh, I want to see him in the bigs. Yeah, he he hit the, uh, remember last year, the uh, home run cycle? Home run cycle. The coolest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. Um, he's also just built like a brick house. Like I just want to see this guy in the bigs yeah. but uh anyways uh, real quick if you don't know what a home run cycle is because it's kind of confusing statement it's uh, yeah, you a solo it home run a two-run home run a three-run home run and a grand slam all in one game it's <laughs> like it's incredible it feels like the single greatest accomplishment you could have in a in one game like as a as an offensive player yeah i, I mean maybe, like four grand slams yeah, in a game yeah. would be but that i don't know i think i'd take the home run cycle yeah, I, I think we as baseball fans overvalue the cycle when uh, yeah four grand slams is clearly better. But uh, I get what you're saying. It is it's just amazing. It's um, yeah, it's obviously get, luck. Yeah, but, I guess uh, yeah. going if you if if you get that many opportunities, you have to imagine that they've batted around sometimes. So like right five five for five with five grand slams would be like <laughs> the the single greatest you could possibly do. Yeah, as a as a baseball player. Yeah. I wonder would that like, is that, would you, how much war would you accrue in one game? If you went five for five with five grand slams? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a way we could figure that out. Email us at talking about birds at gmail.com. <laughs> if you know the answer to it's, that, I, I'm uh, curious. Talk about birds. at gmail. Oh my God. Sorry. I don't have my copy in front of me. Just start emailing things that sound like the yeah. show and we'll get it eventually. Uh, okay, so what I was trying to say, uh, Moises Gomez, he's still here. He's he's in AAA. Yeah. Um, he might get a spring training invite. We'll see. Um, but all that conversation we had last week, I I thought somebody would pick him up, uh, yeah. similar well, it, to it, Guillermo it, Zuniga. It obviously shows the Cardinals know what they're doing a little bit more than we do in this regard because they they clearly felt comfortable releasing him. Um, yeah, expecting him to be to like. I don't know if they thought he would get through or they thought it was a risk worth taking, but like, you know, he, it, he's obviously 29 other teams said, eh, we're good. Which is insane to me because the Rockies could use a Moises Gomez. Yeah. The A's could use a Moises Gomez. There are a lot of teams out there that could use a Moises Gomez. Moises, he might be on the 26 man roster for the Rockies uh, yeah. if they acquired him. Starting first base. But they, yeah, that, that team doesn't understand how to put together a baseball club so here we are and uh, I'm, I'm happy i am happy that we get to have our cake and eat it too um even though it's kind of a shitty 
cake that includes <laughs> Alfonso Rivas and Moises Gomez too. <laughs> uh, very flawed players, but at least we have them. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I mean, he might end up just being a quad A power guy. You know that that uh, that happens a lot, um, but still, it's fun. I'd rather have him Jack and Dongs for the Redbirds rather than somewhere else. We love Jack and Dongs, <laughs> dude. We love jacking dongs. <laughs> That's why we started this show. So we can Hell talk yeah. about it. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's really all the, the Cardinals specific, well, the Cardinals player movement news that has happened uh-huh. this week. There's been, uh, another release of projections, uh, that just came out. And so fan graphs has released their playoff projections, which is always, Fun to look at. I also saw uh, Pakoda put out theirs. Um, and I think unsurprisingly, right now, the Cardinals are being projected kind of across the board to win the NL Central. And in the Pakoda projections, they're not only expected to win the NL Central, they are projected to have the third best record in the NL. Yeah. Now, I don't necessarily think that that's the most likely outcome has been talked about on projections last week. You know, there, this is the idea is they're running these things a million times and it typically spits out like the average kind of most conservative expectation. And so I think, you know, these have the Cardinals winning roughly 85 games and that being a top three result in uh, the NL, which just doesn't seem likely someone's going to hit a uh a, you know a um outlier projection a 10 percent right. projection and someone's going to run into 90 plus wins that wasn't necessarily projected to do that but you know it does give you a general idea going into the season what are these teams looking like what would if everything just sort of plays out as as expected where might these teams land and um kind of across the board We've got the Cardinals coming in first place and the Cubs behind them uh, yeah. by, a few, by a few games, which in the projections world is a lot. Um, right. The Fangraphs projection, I mentioned the Pakota one, Fangraphs has the Cardinals winning 84.4 games and Cubs winning 81.5, um, which again feels like a uh, small gap, but um, that's almost a full 20% more, uh, like the Cardinals have a 20% higher likelihood of winning the NL Central than the Cubs. So you'll love to um, see it. You'll love to see it. And and again, I'm frankly not surprised um with with the Brewers recent movement, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, and the fact that the Cubs haven't yet actually pulled the trigger on just about any major moves this offseason. Um, right. And the Cardinals, you know, are kind of what they always are, which is like there's no bad players on the Cardinals. To, and there's potential for big upside with some guys. Like I think if anybody right now would pick not even just like mathematical um, projections, I think just like the eye test, you'd also probably pick the Cardinals right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What, what do you, what were your thoughts when you saw the uh, projections? Yeah. My thoughts are, it, it makes sense. Of course uh, the Cardinals should, um, they have uh, uh, talent up and down the board. Their position player group is the best in the central and the central is not very good. Um, so that, that, that right. is why the Cardinals that are helps. where they are. Yeah. Um, I, I think the biggest or the two biggest notes, actually, I'll just comment on the, the three teams really quick. I don't see the Cubs starting Mike Talkman in center field for all of 2024. I yeah. don't see Nick Madrigal being the starting third baseman for the Cubs for all of next year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they added a starting pitcher. They got Jordan Wicks, who's fine, um, but relying on Jordan Wicks and Kyle Hendricks to round out your uh, rotation doesn't seem like something they would do. They have a lot of money to spend. So, yeah, I think they have some clear and obvious ways to improve the team. Um, and I would not be shocked if the Cubs either tie or leapfrog the Cardinals before spring training starts. Yeah. Um, I still really think Cody Bellinger is going to be a Cub. Um, yeah. hasn't happened yet though. Well, it certainly, it, the off season is ground to a halt in some oh ways. Oh my God. It's with, insane. With, 
Yeah, with some of these guys. Now, there's been a bunch of things over the last week, which we'll talk about. But like, as far as the major free agents go, right, it is completely stalled. Um, you know, and I, I saw reported that Cody Bellinger right now has only actually received one contract offer, and it was from the Yankees. Um, so yeah, I don't know yeah. what the Cubs. It's interesting. I don't. The Cubs are a smart organization. I hate to say it, but it's true. They they've been doing a really good job at their rebuild, and so either they are very confident in their own evaluation and believe that the market's going to come down and they can jump on some of these guys or for whatever reason, they don't feel like this free agent class is the group to spend their money on right uh, outside of the guys who've already been signed. We know they were pursuing Otani Yamamoto, stuff like that. They might be thinking Bellinger, those hard hit rates. They're scary. We're not going to give them 150 million Snell. That walk rate, you know, he's a ticking time bomb. We're not giving him 150 million and they're just waiting for the dominoes to fall and they'll scoop up some other guys and sort of raise the floor. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I also would be totally unsurprised for the Cubs to uh, in the next two weeks sign both Bellinger and Snell and someone else. And just they're waiting for the market to play out a little bit more. Uh, they could we'll do it. We know Boris has all the cards and what does Boris do? He sits around and he gets his guys the best deal unless yeah. um, he absolutely cannot. So yeah, I, I think, I think that uh, is, is, is likely actually is what I would say. And I do you think it'll take more. I think it'll oh, take more than one move though, for the Cubs to leapfrog the Cardinals. I think adding Bellinger is a big plus for them. It, it narrows that gap a lot, but I think the Cardinals are still the favorite if they hey. do though, Bellinger and Snell or something like that, or add uh, several uh mid-tier starting pitchers then i think it you know it's it's a yeah. crap shoot there there were talks of them trading christopher morell too a guy that yeah. doesn't really have of a position but has a lot of power maybe they move him and improve their pitching staff or uh you know yeah. the other other parts i just of can't the imagine they're done yeah um, same thing with the Brewers. The Brewers are obviously uh, uh retreating back, uh hiding away from everyone, uh running away scared in the NL Central, <laughs> whether it be money, whether it be I mean, the timing of Brandon Woodruff's injury for the Brewers was really, really bad. They really had yeah. one more shot to put out Freddie Peralta, Brandon Woodruff, and Corbin Burns to have a you know a three-headed monster, try it one more time to see if they could push. Woodruff goes down, they end up trading Burns, and that kind of waterfalled into, I, I think this team is going to continue to retract. I wouldn't be surprised if they move Willie Adamas. Uh, Reese Hoskins has midseason transaction written all over him yes. with the contract that he signed. Um, and if I heard stories that they're shopping Christian Yelich, that would not shock me either. So I, I actually see them retracting from their the projected 80.8 wins going into this season. Yeah, if there's any one of these top three that I think are the most likely to end up in the bottom two, um, then I, I'd say it's the Brewers. I'm I I think the Reds are going to have a better season than the Brewers. Yeah. That said, uh, I the the Burns trade was very surprising, and my initial reaction was one that of that they kind of got fleeced. The more I've looked into it the the less i feel that way but it is obviously a huge step back for 2024 yeah. uh, specifically um but they do have some very interesting very high end players right around the corner specifically yeah. Jackson Cherio who's probably going to start in the majors and then Joey Ortiz who they just got should be a good get for them so there's there is this world where those guys come up this year and completely pop and and the brewers are better than we're expecting but Again, that's well, relying on like 19 and 20 year olds to come into the major leagues and and be good. So and uh, it's like like I mentioned earlier, though, their loot, their two best players from last year and the past few years are not there anymore. Corbin right. Burns and Woodruff and, and their starting so pitchers, which are, you know, have a huge impact if you happen to have someone of their caliber. So, right. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, like you mentioned with the Reds, I think that they're the one of the most impossible to project teams right now yeah. because of how much young talent is on that team. Um, and even like outside of the uh, Ellie De La Cruz and the and the Spencer Steer and Matt McClain, uh, is TJ Friedel going to repeat what he was doing last year? Is Will Benson a real power threat in right field? Um uh, is Christian Encarnacion Strand going yeah. to establish himself as a as a power first base DH type? 
Um, is uh, Jake Nick Fra- Lodolo, uh, Jake Fraley. Yeah. They're, they're Fraley. pitching staff. There yeah. So many questions, but I will say there's so many guys uh, that I like uh, some of those names I already mentioned. Um, uh, no, they, uh, no LV, uh, Marte, Marte is somebody yeah. who's really exciting. Um, and some of their pitching is really exciting. I w- it would not shock me if they were fighting the Cardinals tooth and nail yes. for first place in the division. I I think the Cardinals going in this year are projected to have the best offense. And I think that is still the most likely outcome because you have your Arenados and your Goldschmidt's and, and, you know, we, we have our opinions on Walker and, and, uh, Gorman and whatnot, but the sheer amount of high upside talent that the Reds have, they don't even need it. They don't even need half of them to hit, to to like hit that potential for their lineup to suddenly be pretty elite. Um, if even yeah. just a quarter of those names you listed become uh, what <laughs> some people are projecting them to be, like the Reds are going to be a problem. Uh, yep. Now, but they also play in the band, you know, in the the band box, and their pitching is is suspect. Although it's, you know, it it has its own set of upside as well. So you can just see where this could, like you said, they're impossible to pr- uh, project. I agree 100%. It's like they might win 65 games. They might win 98 games when yeah. Ellie De La Cruz goes 40 40 and Matt, <laughs> you know, and Matt McClain is the, you know, uh, best second baseman in, in the league. And, and Jonathan India, who is apparently going to play first base now, you know, he seems like the old guy out. He's what, 24, maybe 25. So, yeah, uh, yeah they got a lot of, they got a lot of talent. And they could still move somebody and go get a a, a high level pitcher. They could go yeah. get an ace for any of those guys that we were just talking about. A package. Uh, Spencer Steer doesn't really fit there. Maybe he goes and gets them. He was great last year. He was yeah. like he, he was a real breakout, but he just got kind of you know lost in the Ellie uh, hype and just the fact that the Reds still really struggled. You know, yeah. like, but Jake, like he's good. He's one yes. of the ones I'm most confident in actually being like he's going to be there or he'll, he'll be a major league hitter. The reds are about to be a problem and it's either going to happen this year or it's going to happen next year, but it's coming. Right. Yes. Agree. A hundred percent. Um, so yeah. And as far as projections go, like I think, uh, Cardinals Cubs and reds, it's kind of anyone's game. And if there's, if anyone is going to do any sort of one more, major move it maybe puts you at the top of it um, yeah the reds might need a little bit more but we would just we really don't know they yeah. they might already be stacked they might be stacked right now <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah like i mean geez think if, if hunter green clicks in this right. coming year yes yeah. that could be it that could be the yeah. nail in the coffin yeah uh montas like might be uh you know great return like oh, it'll be it, so annoying if that works out well for them i, I know yeah yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about some of our own uh, exciting young players. Um, uh, Yvonne Herrera, uh, you know, future uh, backup catcher. And I think probably, you know, a, a larger role than most backup catchers have in the league since we expect yeah. uh, Wilson Contreras to uh, DH a fair amount. Um, he's been uh, kind of tearing it up down in the Caribbean series. You want to run through the stats real quick? Yeah. So again, you know, it's the Caribbean series. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, this is hard fought baseball. These guys are, are yeah. killing each other for this game. Uh, and it should be, no, this is only five games. It's 23 plate appearances from Ivan Herrera, but he already has two home runs, eight RBIs. He's hitting 438, uh, average with a 609 on base percentage. Uh, and he's walking as much as he's striking out, both just about 22%. Um, and it's really like just more of the same really ever since he made that change to his batting stance. Yeah. He has become a, his, his eye has been tremendous. And then that is kind of translated to him keeping a high average with a little bit of power. And I, I don't know. I I'm I, the hype train is starting Nate. Like I think it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if he is taking starts, not taking starts from Wilson Contreras, but forcing his way into the lineup. And maybe that's DH. Maybe that's catching. Maybe that's catching while Wilson is DHing. Maybe some combination of this. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, it's it's high level competition. He's performing well. Um, he made a change and it's being reflected positively. And 
I think we should start. Yeah. I don't know. Start buying the jerseys. Start getting excited. I know. This guy's the I'm, future. I'm trying not to get too hyped about it. Um, but, you know, let's not forget that this guy was flying up prospect ranks until yeah. uh, he had his sort of stumble at the major league level. And and as far as rankings go, that usually is it. And then also, uh, since he no longer has like a direct path to uh, like full time yeah. catcher status, that also hurts prospect rankers because they just say like, well, he's just never going to be the starter for the Cardinals. So his right. ceiling is kind of capped. Um, but uh, I say all that to say like, this isn't coming out of nowhere, right? He, he's right. been good for a long time and it definitely feels like there's something that sort of unlocked in the last year. And uh, I, I'm pretty hyped about it. Um, you know, where those, where those plate appearances come from and how they find that balance with Contreras will be very, very interesting because, uh, Contreras was great last year too. So good problem to have. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It'll be an interesting narrative to see how Marmol and crew find that balance. Uh, maybe yeah. Wilson Contreras in the outfield. I Let's just have that. That's, not the, that's the one <laughs> thing I don't want to happen. I, I don't want, I, I think having too many good offensive catchers is a good problem. I mean, yeah. the, the blue Jays make it work. The Cardinals can figure it out too, but my God, don't put Wilson Contreras in left. Or right field. <laughs> I hate yeah. it. Yeah, I'd rather. Um, I guess I'd rather just Contreras DH more and yes. and let can let Herrera uh, get more starts at catcher. Better for Contreras too, as he's getting older. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, it'll be good. Especially it will be calling and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last thing I wanted to hit before we go to the break. Uh, Keith Law put out his annual prospect ranking uh, and, you know, think whatever you want about Keith Law. I personally think he's a little bit annoying and like a, he's like a weird, like Internet edge lordy baseball nerd type thing, which mm -hmm. I don't you know, whatever. That doesn't matter. That's just me complaining about another person who's online too much. Um, <laughs> but he had some really nice things to say about Mason Wynn. First off, Mason Wynn was the 16th best prospect in baseball, which is definitely yeah. high. Uh, Keith Law is higher on him than a lot That's of folks. the highest I've seen it of of anyone right. anywhere is 16th. Um, and, and I think Cardinals fans know uh, Mason Wynn is very fast. No, his glove is solid. No, his arm is one of the best arms we've ever seen from shortstop. It's he's breaking records like every time yeah. he starts a game. Uh, but I, I picked out this little uh, section of the uh, 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 of the write up on Mason Wynn, and I thought it was kind of exciting. Uh, he says he has outstanding plate discipline for his age across all dimensions of that term. His pitch, pitch selection, his pitch type recognition, and his ball strike recognition are all well above average or better for someone who's been young at every level he's played in pro ball. Um, and I don't think that's something that I've really read about Mason Wynn. He also yeah. goes on in the article to talk about his bat speed and how that can develop and and what we can expect from that. But the glowing regards on his offensive profile is something really, really exciting. And I'm curious to see now that he has had his cup of coffee, he's been under the bright lights and maybe, you know, understandably, you're not playing your game when you first get called up to the big leagues because, oh, my God, right. life is crazy. Uh, but I wonder if that's going to this is going to be a predictor for how Mason Wynn goes this year. If, if that becomes part of his game at the big league level, I think it's very exciting. Yeah, the story with Mason Wynn has been over and over and over is that he gets promoted, the defense carries, and he struggles offensively, makes the adjustments, and becomes good. Now, he right. is not a, you know, he, he we, we've used the Raphael for call comp a lot to sort of talk about that offensive profile. Yeah. Higher average, mostly built on the fact that he's so fast. He's turning a lot of uh, infield ground balls into singles, things like that. Um, low end, modest power. Um, you know, we, I think if he ever surpasses 20 home runs in a year, like that will be his, probably his best year of his career. Um, but 15 to 20 is reasonable. And then yeah. with that speed and um, I, you know, and the new rules, the sky's the limit on stolen base count. It could, yeah. I mean, he, he could be a, 30 plus stolen base guy. If that's what, if, if that's how he decides to go about it and that's what the team wants from him and, you know, stolen bases are 
an interesting equation, but like he's got the talent to be one of those guys who is average to like elite at basically every part of baseball. And his final stat line isn't necessarily going to blow you out of the water, but I bet his war totals, if we get that player, will be very yeah. high because you'll see him as someone who's doing everything. It's kind of like Tommy Edmond back uh, uh, two years ago when he had that 5.7 war season or whatever. Like, you know, it just, he did everything. He was, he did everything really, really well. And it just right. stacked. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is part of why all the projection system kind of uh, uh, like Mason win and, and where he's going. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, not to mention the highlights that he's going to provide us. I, oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not to just get all hypey, but spring training's about to start. Dude, and even this is Rara, the time to be hype. And yeah. these are the guys, you know, this is these are hopefully the future guys of the Cardinals, you know, like, yeah. Um, the win hype train has only been diminished a little bit because of the September call up and, and his right. struggles offensively. He had like a 29 WRC plus or something like really, really bad. But again, we've yeah. seen him get promoted, struggle, make the adjustment and excel. And that is the standard story for va- basically every single major league baseball player. Yeah. Uh, and he's young, you know, so uh, it might be a couple years before we get that like truly, you know, adjusted, comfortable, excellent offense. But with his defense, you don't even need it to be that crazy yeah. for him to be valuable. Really, really getting excited. Yes. Same. All right. Well, um, yeah, we're just a few weeks, a few weeks, Hambone, from uh from starting to see uh Baseball people doing baseball activities. The most anticlimactic uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> deadline of all time. Well, we're going to see some soft tossing and some stretching, you know. The day this show drops, we are 14 days away from the Cardinals' yeah. first spring training game. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Um, and we're going to keep bringing coverage every single week. And at this point, when I like to remind everybody that this show is listener supported on wow. Patreon patreon.com slash talking about birds. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show and uh, want to show your support, uh, we really, really appreciate you checking out our Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com slash talking about birds. If you join the Patreon at any level, you get access to our private discord server, the bird scored. Uh, it's been growing. We've been having a lot of good conversations in there and uh, we're getting ready to fire up our fantasy baseball season. So if you're interested in that, you can get in there. Um, ben and I are talking about uh, doing more dedicated channels on like watching games together as a group and just, you know, again, having a place where you can go and be a part of a Cardinals fan community where you actually get to like talk to people and get to know them and not just throwing stuff out into the ether of the confusing social media landscape that we find <laughs> ourselves in now yeah. to uh to say the least so um much love to all of our patrons and if you're considering it check it out uh we we really really appreciate it um you can also help us out by leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform it helps uh we are now on youtube so check that out if that's your preferred way to listen to uh, to podcast, you can smash that subscribe button. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying. You know, get no, in where good. you fit in. It was you good. Know what I mean? I'm sorry. Wow. It was good. You're right. Um, I'm gonna start. I I I gotta do pictures of like you and I looking just absolutely flabbergasted at something. You know, yeah. and use that as our uh as our image for every YouTube with clip art uh, in between us yeah. screaming at thing. Yeah. That- Can you believe John Mazalek said this? <laughs> Doctors hate these five little baseball oh, God, tricks. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Hambone, where can people find us online? Otherwise? Yeah. Follow us on Twitter at talk about birds. We're on Instagram at talking about birds. You can email us questions to talk about birds at gmail.com. Again, that is talkaboutbirds at gmail.com. Or if you know uh, the answer to how much war a five for five with five Grand Slams uh, uh, game would calculate, I'd I'd be curious to know that. We're on Spotify. Hit us up on Spotify. Like and review us there as well. We got a TikTok. Come look at our faces on TikTok if that's something that you're into. 
You can find all of that information, Patreon, t-shirts, all that crap at talkingaboutbirds.com. And as we already mentioned in this show, you can call us or text us at 848-48-BIRDS, 848-482-4737. Hit us up. 848-48-BIRDS. Yeah. uh, Questions, comments, contributions to our random games and things like if you have something you want to say to us, throw it in a text message and send it. Uh, we love to see it. We love it, folks. We really do. We really do. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, a lot of news over the last yes. week. Um, so let's let's jump in. What do you got for us? Yeah, a lot of news. We'll try to go through this as quick as we can. Um, last week, we talked about how the Orioles uh, are under new ownership or in the process of, uh, of being under new ownership, and they do um, new ownership type things. We already talked about it, that they acquired Corbin Burns from the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, yes. I'd, I'd say a top 10 pitcher in baseball uh, for rookie infielder Joey Ortiz, who uh, is probably going to be quite the player, uh, left-hander D.L. Hall, who's got good stuff, and a competitive balance round uh, uh, pick uh, number 34 overall for the upcoming draft. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just go real quick. I think this is the best possible move that the Orioles could have made. Um, it essentially does not affect their future or big league team. Uh, Joey Ortiz is a good player, but n- nobody they need with the uh, infield that they have and the other guys who are still in the system. They yeah. have still uh, six top 100 prospects. Um, and Corbin Burns is as good as they get. So I I love this deal for them. I hope that they can retain Corbin Burns. And then I guess on the other side, looking through the Cardinals lens, it's nice to have him out of the central. Yes. Yes, Because he is is good. Yeah. I, I kind of shared most of my feelings about it earlier, but I think that this was an incredible move for the Orioles in 2024. Um, it's like exactly what we've all wanted this team to do, which is right actually put their foot on the gas and say, we're going for it, which is what the entire previous ownership was unwilling to do. They so far as they would seemingly were unwilling to even say we want to win. (laughs) So (laughs) it's, it's nice to see. Uh, It's actually, it's kind of crazy to me. Like, I don't know the, like the, how these sort of inner machinations of team ownership even works. I, it's like, I don't think the deal is done, but uh, no, and it might it might be a while, but this has to be at the impetus of the new ownership, right? You, you imagine there's some type of billionaire thing of like, hey, I want you to go get this guy. Um, here's my instructions. Um, and don't worry about it because I'm going to be paying a salary anyways. But you imagine there's right. some type of handshaky type deal yeah. when, when these kinds of contracts are being signed. And we're talking about almost two billion dollars being exchanged, you, you know, that but uh yeah, it is. Yeah. It is wild how quickly it that almost happened. immediately, and then yeah. the level of the splash that they made. Yeah. Um, like I said, I don't know if there was a better pitcher who is quote unquote available on the trade market that they could have gotten. No, I don't. I really don't think so. I mean, they could have possibly gone and blown out. Uh, you know, their prospect depth is so high that they could arguably have gone and really got anyone they wanted. Right. But at this cost, it was really the, it's the perfect boot for them. It is. Now that said, um, when the trade was initially announced, I, and a lot of people were kind of laughing at the, uh, at the brewers. Cause it felt like, uh, they got fleeced and I'm always going to look for that in these sorts of things of because I want to laugh at the brewers. And, you know, they had, they'd done the hater trade recently and we're still all kind of laughing at that. And you see this trade and it's like, man, what are they doing over there? Um, but if you really pull back, if the brewers were saying, we're not going to try to win this year, um, then I think they actually got a really good return for Corbin Burns. Um, Joey Ortiz is probably going to slot in as their starting third baseman, maybe shortstop. If they do trade, uh, Adam is, and, uh, don't sleep on DL Hall. You know, he he was a uh, yeah. he was a top prospect, sort of faded a little bit, but really seemed to unlock something uh late last year um in the bullpen, but I think they're going to have him as a starter, which is what he initially always was projected to be. And we don't have to deal with Corbin Burns next year, which is great, but I I worry that DL Hall is about to be 
a uh, real thorn in the side. And and with with the Brewers' obvious ability to uh, to develop pitching, yeah, um, I think he's going to be very very good for the Brewers. So uh, not to mention that thirty fourth overall pick, like that's a very valuable pick as well. So, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, it's a good trade for both sides, you know? Yeah. Um, and as a Cardinal fan, I'm here for it because it does make the roadmap for 2024 just a little bit easier. And that's what we're looking for right now. So <laughs> I'll take it. it. It sure does. And like we talked about, it signals what direction the Brewers are moving generally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you said, I, I agree. Th- those players are solid and they'll probably be a pain in the ass going forward. Yeah. Um, in a somewhat corresponding move, the Brewers decided to sign Jacob Junis to a one-year, $7 million deal. Um, yeah, that's, I don't really have anything else to say about that other than, I don't know, he probably won't start very often for them. He'll probably be a yeah. swing man, I guess. I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, it's um, fine. Yeah. In a much more exciting move than that, the Royals and Bobby Witt agree to an 11 year extension guaranteeing nearly $288.78 million. There are player options after 2030, 31, 32, and 33, uh, Mm -hmm. which is insane to talk about that. He is so young and so good. The deal's maximum value could balloon up to 377 million over 14 years. Um, Bobby Witt's an amazing player. He yeah. really improved his defense and he's a great offensive player last year. Uh, and the Royals do the thing that you need to do. They, they retained their generational superstar, uh, you know, until we're talking about years that start with the three. Um, yeah. So it's, it's incredible. Really happy for Royals uh, fans. Really happy for Bobby Witt. I really hope that they can build around him. Um, he's one of the most exciting players in baseball. I, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I think it's awesome. Yeah, same. Um, and this is what it looks like if you wait until after the breakout year for, <laughs> a, for an extension of your, yeah. uh, generational player, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, still but likely it, a deal. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I, I bet he ends up, I, I'm a huge Bobby Witt fan. I think he is going to be like a perennial MVP candidate for the next yeah. 10 years. So I'm suspecting that he's going to op- be opting out after that 2030 deal because 30 million, $35 million a year is probably going to be low for a guy like him. But yeah. even still, they've locked him up for the core of his, you know, the, the core of his career, the next yeah. six, seven years, Bobby Wood is, is a Royal. Um, and I think that's great. And it also shows, uh, any team can do this. If the, if, <laughs> if the Royals yes. can lock up their young talent on a $300 million deal, uh, everybody can do it. So yeah. it's, it's just whether the teams want to, whether they are, whether the owners yeah. feel it is financially prudent or not. There is you, no, there is no small market element to this. Like yes, everybody can do this. Did the DeWitts, how angry do you think the DeWitts were when they, when they read this come across the the news? Like, uh, like, yeah, you, it you tri- think there's like any triples the-, the highest contract in Cardinal history. Yeah. You know? Now the, and- do the Cardinals have a Bobby Witt? Like we hope Jordan Walker is generational, but Bobby Witt's yeah. already showing it, you know? Yeah. So also older than Jordan though. So we'll, we'll see older. how the timing, but like you said, if Jordan breaks out in 24, this is what the deal this would look is what like. We're gonna have to it's do. a lot yeah. cheaper today. So yeah, yeah. But uh, but again, it's always a two way street. Too Walker. Uh, they, w- for all we know, they approached Jordan Walker and offered him something, and yeah. he said, "No, I'm about to hit 40 bombs, and y'all are yeah. gonna have to pay me." You know, we never no, know. Watch it's, this. It's easy. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to say these things in a vacuum, but it right. does require the you know both sides to be into it. Yeah. Uh, moving on, talking about players retaining good play or teams retaining good players. The Astros signed Jose Altuve to a five-year extension worth 125 million bucks. Uh, this will likely take him close to the end of his career, if not the end of his career. Um, and uh, yeah, probably a good move. Um, it, it's so funny. He went from having one of the most team-friendly deals of all time to getting like these back-to-back, really healthy extensions. Um, yeah. And, you know, say whatever you want about Jose Altuve, but he is a good player. 
seemingly yeah. a halfway decent person, uh, at least publicly. Um, and yeah, good for him. Yeah. I mean, if, if it wasn't for one massive glaring situation <laughs> that he was a part of, yeah. I think Altuve would be a across the board fan favorite. Yeah. You love a short king. And he yeah. hits the shit out of the ball, and he's been the centerpiece of multi. You know, he's the centerpiece, essentially of a dynasty. You know, right. like he he's an incredible player, um, and you know his reputation is forever impacted. But yeah, five one twenty five. You know, it'll be interesting to see how he ages as this contract does bring him into like his mid late thirties. Like yeah speed has always been a part of his game but also 25 million a year at this point from an organization like the Astros too like it's fine you know he doesn't necessarily have to be that all-star MVP candidate that he's always been for that still to return value and I think there's just value in having a franchise cornerstone player cornerstone player end his career with the team that's yeah. that's real value to the club it might not be on field value as much but there will be so many uh, oh, celebrations yeah. and events and everything around this. And yeah, I just, you love to see it. You love to see somebody like Bobby Witt stay with the Astro or the uh, Royals. And you love to see the, the longtime Astro remain an Astro. It's just, yeah, it's fun. Speaking yeah. of, I guess, uh, retaining players that just keep going down this, uh, the Dodgers have decided to bring back Clayton Kershaw at least yeah. one more time. So no, no longer are we worried about him missing out on the Otani Yamamoto party. He is invited to the party. Uh, wow. as the elder statesman and uh will you know probably have a very solid 120 innings and get blown up in the playoffs yeah <laughs> yeah the only thing surprising to me about this is that it happened already because yeah. i think it, it seemed pretty inevitable i i kind of thought that they were just gonna wait until he was like fully back and he'd yeah. sign in like june or something um right. but it, at the end of the day it doesn't really matter when it was it was pretty obvious he He's going to be a Dodger, I think, until he retires. And it, it could be after this year, even. We'll see. Could be. Yeah. Um, he's already started talking about retirement and he's already inner circle hall of fame, you know. Yeah. So he doesn't need to. But I know the Dodgers are really looking for that non COVID era. He um, that's what he World wants to win. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I think so. that's the same thing. If they win this year, it'll be his last year. Yeah, I think that's a uh, Unless he like completely rebounds and pitches like a somehow right. like a, a full starters workload. If, if this season ends up being another one where he kind of ends it um, on the shelf a little bit, I yeah. bet he retires too. Yeah. Just the way he ended last year, there's, I, I, I thought there's no way he wasn't coming back. Like how, how could you yeah. end with like one of the worst starts of your entire career? Yeah. Um, but some people don't get to make that choice. Clayton Kershaw does. Yeah. Uh, the Dodgers also sign Ryan Brazier to a two year, $9 million deal. And um, I'll say I hate this deal because the, it's Ryan Brazier is a pretty good player. Um, he made some improvements last year. And this yeah. seems like a really cheap price for a really good pitcher or not a really good pitcher, but a solid bullpen arm. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah I, Dodgers keep he, dodgering. Yeah, I mean, the Dodgers brought him in last year and basically yeah. revitalized his career. Um, he put up uh, 1.1 F4 as a reliever uh, for the Dodgers last year, which is really hard to break that 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 one, that digit with as a yeah. reliever. And um, he did it, you know, that sort of pitching factory they have there. Uh, this one, I'm a little more okay with it, only because he's 36 and a half years old and we yeah. don't need more, more jokes. Oh, about I don't know. Them. <laughs> but um you know it's uh yeah it'll yeah. be annoying when he's their setup man and yeah uh, with boston in 21 innings he had a 729 era he comes over to la 38 and two thirds innings a 0.7 era so uh yeah yeah went yeah, well though that is xfip he did get a little lucky you know it was a 4.0 yeah. last year overall so but boston's think- defense was shit last year that doesn't yeah. surprise me yeah um and I don't know what the split is. His his season XFIP was was four. So a lot of that might just be from the Boston time. Yeah, uh, 508 with Boston and a 347 with okay. LA. Pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty good. Uh, the Rays signed Cardinals legend Phil Maton to a one-year $6.25 <laughs> million dollar deal. 
Uh, so that reunion or that, uh, uh, rumored union and, and I don't know how many times that was confirmed. It's not happening. He's a Ray. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with getting Middleton, like obviously you and I both were kind of high on Mayton. Um, I, I don't know, I guess I hadn't really been thinking about Middleton until they signed yep. him and, and I dug into the numbers and I'm pretty excited about Middleton, frankly. Um, but I think we would have been also pretty happy with Mayton, but once yep. Middleton was signed, I was like, all right, we're not, you know, this is probably it. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll take the Middleton deal like slightly yeah. over the Mayton deal. The, the, the second year potential, uh, if things go well, the Cardinals yeah. get a little extra value. That's, that's really nice. Um, yeah. but yeah, uh, just funny that it just never happened. Uh, yeah. Theo was Epstein. it Bob Nightingale, Bob Nightingale that said like, no, no, it never got that level. It was someone, yeah. some random person on Twitter that was saying, yeah. yeah okay. It, it was rumored for like four different times, I think, and, and yeah. maybe confirmed one time. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, Theo Epstein joins Fenway Sports Group as a partial owner and senior advisor. Um, you know, it's I, I don't know if this is that groundbreaking news, but it, it is just crazy. This this guy is such a wonderkin that he's basically like, I don't know, worked him his way into ownership without being a billionaire. Um, yeah. And now he's just advising people how to spend their money and how to run their various sports teams. Um, I know this ownership group owns uh, teams that aren't baseball teams, the Red Sox, uh, I think a, w- at least one NHL team and a, a premier league soccer team there. There's just, he's got his hands in all kinds of pots, but, uh, yeah, kind of crazy. And, uh, I guess good for them. Um, continuing with the Red Sox, uh, it was just announced today that the Red Sox are going to be featured in a new Netflix documentary. Uh, the documentary crew will follow the Red Sox in 2024. Um, and the series will come out in 2025. If this is anything like, the other sports documentaries that Netflix has been doing. I am super excited for this. I, I know I've talked yeah. about full swing. Uh, there's a lot of F one fans that came out of watching uh, drive to survive on Netflix. Uh, so if it's that same production group and and they're doing a similar thing, I'm super excited to see what yeah. happens here. Yeah. I, I was thinking also of that um, football show, hard knocks, which I think hard knocks Fox- is on HBO. Okay. Yeah. They, that they did a follows- quarterback one. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the I, I only just saw this right before it we started recording. So this isn't going to be like sort of live during the season. It's going to happen. It's going to be like produced and come out after the season. Exactly. Okay. Well, yeah, that, so I, typically, like the way that full swing works is that they film a season and then they like build a bunch of episodes based on little individual narratives um, yeah. that have to do with certain players and stuff. So I'm sure it'll be like. There'll be an episode on Trevor Story's arm and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. I mean, that, so super produced. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, we don't, there's not a lot of that content out there, there uh, is for not. baseball. So baseball um, is weird about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure it all, we've talked about this a bunch. I'm sure it all stems back to the fact that baseball is a sport about failure. And so, yeah. like, it's, but that's why I asked like the year for doing it, filming it and then producing it a year later will allow them to like build a, a more enjoyable viewing yeah. experience. Um, but I would still love a like it'd be interesting to see a like with the team style week to, doc, week, yeah. week, to week sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, as you know, with this kind of groundbreaking documentary show happening and the the live interviews that uh, ESPN does. It does seem like these gates are starting to open up and maybe a hard knocks type baseball yeah. show will happen soon. Who knows? Maybe if, well, we've talked about the MLB taking ownership over their own broadcast rights. Like that's the sort of content I'd be looking at producing too. If you're, yeah. if like, if you imagine the, the MLB, MLB app, the, the MLB. yeah, that MLB, nah, uh, <laughs> leave me alone. If I imagine MLB <laughs> will, uh, <laughs> that's the sort of stuff you'd want to see. Like that'll bring in subscribers to whatever your MLB app is. If now there's like more live coverage in a documentary style or something. Oh yeah. I mean, I like how many people are F1 fans strictly because of that show. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think getting to know Rafi Devers, getting to know Alex Cora, getting to know, uh, uh, Tristan Casas, they have some good personalities on that team. I I think it'll be, 
it should be a boon. Yeah, we'll see. I, I'm still holding out hope for uh, it would be the 12th inning, I think, for uh, uh, baseball Ken by Ken Burns. Yeah, yeah if uh, if he if um, where is it? 11th. The last one was 11th inning, right? So it'd be uh, I don't tw- remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever. It's been. Um, yeah, it's been. And uh, hey, it's been uh, between hey. the time between the last two is roughly the amount of time we are now. So yeah, um, maybe he's working on another one. It'd be good great. to work, Kenny. Do it, Kenny. I want to. I want to see Altuve in the trash can. Yes, oh, it'd be so good. Give me that. Give me that Ken Burns effect. Um. All right. Last piece of news is complex, so I'm going to try to parse this out the best that I can. Uh, but we are talking about the A's and their potential move to Las Vegas. In the news this week, we saw that the Nevada Teachers Union sued uh, to block the A's Las Vegas stadium deal. Uh, a teacher-backed political action committee on Monday sued the state and the governor, uh, Joe Lombardo, challenging the legality of the bill that last year guaranteed $380 million in public money to a new Las Vegas stadium for the A's. Um, the, so what the teachers union is specifically suing about is the way in which that money was allocated the vote. It was a 50, 50 vote and uh, the ballot that is now being brought up or, or sorry, the re geez, sorry, this is a little complicated and I'm an idiot, but essentially the, the teachers union is suing saying that that vote was illegal. What they want to have happen is for the vote to happen again and require a two-thirds majority rather than a 50-50 majority. Um, and they're essentially just uh, suing for like a tech- legal technicality, trying to do everything that they can to block the stadium being built. Really what it comes down to is that if the state of Nevada is going to spend $380 million, then the teachers union um, and, and teachers in general in the public school system deserves to have money. Maybe those things can happen together. Maybe uh, uh, you fund both of these things with state money. Maybe you just try to make a point. Um, we really don't know what's going to happen here, but uh, the teachers union is kind of doing everything that they can to slow this down, to make their point heard. Um, and I'll say, not only do I think Fisher is a, a slimy piece of shit, um, but of course I'm going to side with the teachers, uh, who we all know are under undervalued, underpaid, under-resourced and, um, subsidizing a billionaire who was born into being a billionaire, um, and is just trying to make a money move by moving this team is not something that I think the state government should be involved in. Uh, so that's my two cents on the situation. Hopefully that made some sense. Preach cuz. Preach. <laughs> yeah. Pro labor. Let's go. I yeah, I've been uh I've been particularly ranty for a little while on the show, so I'll I'll keep it you you've ranted for me, I think, in this in this moment. But yeah, it's absolutely absurd to me that we are con- that uh, this a state government is considering giving um uh, a billionaire three hundred and eighty million dollars when uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, another it, aspect of what the teachers are mad about. And I think what some people in Nevada are mad about is essentially there's not strong enough enough language to punish our billionaires if they decide to default on the money that they're borrowing and the tax incentives. So if Fisher decides to give everyone in Nevada the middle finger, the taxpayers are responsible for covering that difference. And there's Mm -hmm. really nothing that they can do um, to force that back on Fisher, at least the way that it is currently written and displayed out. And I think outside of the teachers union, normal Nevadans have an issue with that. Um, and, you know, the mayor has been a little wishy-washy on her opinions. The Las Vegas mayor has been a little wishy-washy. Yeah, um, it's it's complex. Um, it is complicated because there has been some success with moving sports leagues to Las Vegas, right? There's yeah. a reason why this is even the Super happening. Bowl this weekend is being played yeah. in Las Vegas. Yeah. yeah. And forever it was it felt like you can't do a sports team in Vegas because there's no it's there's not a big enough existing population. But that's not the case anymore. And there's obviously right. successful sports leagues there. And and as the mayor, you know, I I think her 
ultimate statement is the most politician friendly statement, which is that she said, I believe that the Oakland Athletics should stay in Oakland where they have an existing diehard fan base. But if they were to move, Las Vegas is a great place to be, you know? Yeah. So it's like, okay, cool. Thanks. Way to say nothing. Yeah. yeah, In a few sentences. Exactly. And so uh, it's frustrating. Um, And obviously, you know, a teacher's union against the will of a multi-billion dollar industry. It's like, I think we all know where this is going, but if they can make a dent in it and help um, make some change and uh, maybe, re- maybe reduce the amount of taxpayer money that's going to go into the, um, into the stadium, you know, like it, this is all not for nothing. And I think it's incredible that they're, they're putting up a fight and there is an outcome where this works and, yep. it, ha- and it changes everything. So um, I'm, I'm, ho- I'm hoping for it, but I'm not holding my breath. And of course, like, I'm not saying this would solve the problem, but you never hear of somebody like Fisher saying, here's what I'd like to do. I would like to ask this state that I essentially have no business with for almost 400 million bucks, a bunch of tax breaks, this and that, wh- whatever it might be. But how about this? I want to put my own money or I want to put a, a section of the raise revenue Uh, towards building a new school and maybe outfitting these schools with new technology or uh, helping uh, uh, putting money into a teacher pension program. Like there's never that olive branch is never even considered. And I do wonder, like, I still don't think we should be subsidizing these schools, but um, if a little bit of honey would go a long way in these situations, but you just, it's never going to happen. Yeah. I, I do think there are some of those things to be fair. Like, you know, it's a like cardinal care and every time they do something it's like, Oh, we're going to donate a certain amount of after the fact care. they, yeah, yeah, they'll, yeah. But um, we also know that that is to help them with tax at the end. Well, uh, that, like that's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, every time you, you donate, uh, your roundup at a, at a store, you're actually just helping that company get a tax break, right? Like yeah. everything ultimately just filters back to, they're trying to get tax breaks and and game the system. And as soon as those tax breaks are gone, they're looking to go elsewhere because, you know, they'll give them if they give them this nearly four hundred million dollars in various tax breaks, whenever whatever deal runs up, they're just going to say, "Okay, we're going to move again unless you give us those tax breaks again. So it's not there's been enough uh, research done by uh, economic economist. (laughs) Yeah, thank you to um, to prove that. It is. This is not a healthy way to build a uh, a team in a in a city, and um, we're finally catching on to it. Um, but it's still what obviously is what the the owners want. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, they want and that. I think owners want it. And then I also think politicians like to be able to say, "I brought the A's to Vegas." Like that's a a nice yeah. thing to say because it's splashy and exciting. But okay. Anyways, you guys know how we feel. That's yeah. end of league news. Thank you. All right, well, let's do something completely opposite of that, although kind of Vegas uh, related in a way. So, oh, wow. uh, Ben, we're, we're, we're deep in the off season, and so we're getting into some real stupid shit. And I found a uh, <laughs> I found a list on the baseball subreddit that uh, I think will be near and dear to your heart and uh, you know, something you're particularly interested in. And so this week, we're playing Who Charted? Strip Club Edition. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I have here a list of all the teams. Yeah. And how far away in miles. Okay. Is the closest strip club. Wow. Okay. Okay. And I want you to guess. Okay. What stadiums have the closest uh have have strip clubs the closest yeah to them. yeah 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 okay that's yeah. the dumbest shit you've ever done but all right <laughs> <laughs> it's all this list i was like yes this is this is the type of content we you know, uh-huh. we provide okay so, i want your guesses and i want i want you to sort of talk me through it yeah. where do you think the closest strip clubs are okay so what am i just trying to get top five top ten what's what's top the five. goal here Top five. Okay. So um, this this one feels a little easy because I am keenly aware of where the St. Louis Cardinal Stadium is, and I am keenly aware of where those east side strip clubs are. Um, and that has to be like maybe two miles. And 
just because of zoning and whatnot, I can't imagine um, many clubs or many ballparks are that much closer. Uh, so I'm going to say the Cardinals are in the top five. Um, no, Ben, you are going to really? laugh when you find out that uh, the Cardinals are actually in the bottom five. What? <laughs> That's part of why this list was. <laughs> What is going on with this? <laughs> yeah, they are. In okay. the, so 2.7 miles. So you were pretty good. Like you're, you're, you know, you're, I know, you know, yeah. the route you've got the yeah. Uber, uh, route saved. Oh phone. yeah. You know me. I just yeah. I love strip clubs. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so my vibe. Um, I don't feel um, bad for the people that are working there. I just love yeah. it. It's, it's 2.7 point, yeah. 2. miles. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that is in the bottom five. Okay, well, I'm probably going to embarrass myself again, but I am keenly aware of where Coors Field is, and I okay. know exactly where the sh- closest strip club is, which is the Diamond Cabaret, which I've been told has a lovely buffet. Um, and that is that is probably just a hair over a mile, which, man, maybe these are closer. Uh, okay, I'm going to say Coors Field just again because I know how they're walking distance. You could walk there. Yeah, yeah. Again, it is actually pretty remarkable that you've had two of them where you've been really close with the distance. Uh, from Rocky Stadium, it is one mile. Yeah. Uh, so you pretty much nailed that. However, um, they are the 11th closest. What is wrong with these cities? What are you all doing out there? <laughs> Nasty ass. Uh, okay. What's a, what's now, a now nasty... Sex work is work. Okay. Let's not be too... Uh... Let's not be too negative. No. Uh, honestly, but. I don't really have a problem with strip clothes. As long as everybody's in, uh, consensually and having a good time, it is just so not my vibe. Same. Um, and it is a situation ripe for exploit, but yes, there so, are also you know, do your thing. Yeah. There's no judgment yeah. coming from me just for Benny boy. Personally, not yeah. my vibe. Um, okay. Let's see what city, you know, Atlanta is known across the world for their strip clubs. Uh-huh. Um, although they've moved that stadium to the county. So maybe there are, are there strip clubs in the county? I don't know. I've never been outside of like the city proper. Um, but I don't really have anything else to go on. I'm going to go with Atlanta. Give me the Braves. So you are once again, very accurate in your assessment of like the, of the city and it's, distance between its strip clubs. The uh, Atlanta Braves is actually the second furthest because they yeah. are the county. Okay. Um, the this one the closest is 11 miles. That is the second wow. furthest away. Damn. Um, which I believe this one I have also heard of because it is like there was that thing during um COVID. It's I, the Magic NBA City. Bubble. Yeah. The the they you know the wings magic cities were like yeah where like t-pain and all the basketball players go yeah, yeah. and like somebody broke protocol to go and get wings or something Just and he got was like wings wings to go yeah, yeah. amazing <laughs> amazing wings to go from a strip club yeah yeah all right i'm gonna give you a few more guesses uh you've yet okay. to get one in the top uh top five yeah all right uh houston there's a there's a strip club culture there um so I'm leaning towards Houston. Uh, let's see. Boston. I wouldn't want to go to a strip club in Boston. Ew. Um, just kidding. I don't know what that means. Um, let's go. I'll, I'll say Houston. Give me the Astros. So this is the closest you've gotten. They are the eighth um, Damn. at 0.8 miles. And for some reason, the list decided to denote that this one is a male strip club. Uh, oh. Feels... Ooh, la, la. Feels a little um, like homophobic to to c- call that out in the list yeah. here, but um, yeah, point eight miles away uh, is a male strip club. From, Are there uh, any strip clubs that serve both? Hmm, I would imagine so. There should be. Yeah, I you could. I would be very surprised to learn that there's if, if there's not. Yeah, well, tweet I, us I could at- see it being separated in an establishment, but. Surely, no, I, I think you got to keep them together. I think just do it, yeah, spice yeah. it up, yeah. Um, okay, you were about to ask people to tweet at us, uh, so yeah, tweet, call, or text us, uh, <laughs> let us know. Um, yeah, give know. me the website and address of that <laughs> strip club. Um, okay, I'm avoiding the New York teams because I believe New York has rules about strip clubs and uh. Uh, well, I, I don't know that now I don't, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Really. I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to give you one more off. guess and then I'm going to run okay. through the list. 
Um, you know what? Milwaukee. I feel like Milwaukee, um, it's cold out. Uh, maybe you need a strip club to warm you up. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you are climbing, but you're still out of the top five. Damn. Uh, the Brewers are seventh at 0.7 miles. Wow, that is so yeah. close. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I, um, what's number one? I need to at least know number yeah, one. Yeah, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read out the top five. Okay. Uh, the Pirates and the Tigers are tied for fourth uh, at a okay. half a mile. So wow, Detroit and Pittsburgh. Yeah. Okay. Um, coming in at number three, the Minnesota Twins. Okay. At point four miles. All right. Uh, number. Two is your Baltimore Orioles, 0.3 miles. Wow. And finally, number one, Seattle Mariners, wow. point, point 0.1 mile. Wow, man, that's inside the stadium. Also, right there. I was just in Seattle. I was looking at that ballpark, and it's essentially surrounded by like parking lots and warehouses. Yeah. Where the hell is that strip club? I don't know. Um, and you know, I just pulled this list off the internet, so it could all just be bullshit. But I don't know. That seemed seemed well researched. <laughs> sure, <laughs> some freak out there who has way too much time, and I guess likes baseball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very funny list. So, all right, all right. So that was who charted strip club edition. Um, you wow. failed, failed miserably, but of course, I would not expect anyone to know this sort of thing. But uh, now you know. If you want to tie your um baseball going experience uh i was talking with uh one of our new patrons ryan uh the other day and he's he's been doing the you know ticking off the uh the the stadiums you know as yeah. he's as he's traveling malign and, ryan in this conversation about no i'm not i'm not mal- maligning him i'm saying if he's you know he's trying to hit all the stadiums if you're out there and you were wondering i want to both visit all the stadiums and also i want an easy path to a strip club <laughs> um, that's the type of service we provide on this show now you have a now you have a guiding light um, all right yeah i'm yeah. looking right now uh seattle mariners it is uh it is in that like uh uh area that that uh industrial area and it is one it's half a block away it's called dream girls at soto so there you go wow Wonderful. amazing that's yep. maybe the dumbest thing we've ever done on the show. Good job, <laughs> Nate. <laughs> and that'll do it for this week. So thanks as always to our, uh, our listeners. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, assuming Ben and I uh, don't bonk into each other while he's learning to <laughs> ski and I'm, I'm learning to ski and we, you know, smash our big dumb skulls into each other. Yeah. Um, and I don't get tangled up in a, uh, in a ski lift, but, uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. We're so close to baseball happening. Um, I will not say that the quality of this show will improve or the games will improve when we have actual baseball, but I think we'll all feel a little bit better. About hey, we'll the, still uh, be here, though. That, that's yeah, for sure. We will be here week after week. That's what we do. So thanks again, everybody. And until next week, go Cardinals. Thank you. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking About Birds, the only Cardinal podcast that, like Ra- Rob, oh, damn it. <laughs> pop the trunk, pop the trunk. Here we go. Starting over. <laughs>